Hello and welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point. I'm Li Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CGTM page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at the point with LX at CGTN.com. Let me know what you think. We live stream Headline Buster at 11 a.m. Beijing time on Thursdays and air the segment on TV at 11.30 a.m. on Friday. So do join me during the live streaming and uh, get in touch. We would love to receive and possibly read out your insightful comments. This week, we're looking at media reports on Taiwan. How are news outlets covering U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi's possible visit to the island? Are media giving people a clear picture of what's going on or hyping up the so-called China thread, even pushing for her visit? I've got my examples ready to go, but first, what is the story? On July the 19th, the Financial Times reported that Nancy Pelosi would visit Taiwan along with a delegation in August, according to six people familiar with the situation. The trip would be the first by a U.S. House Speaker in 25 years. Pelosi had intended to visit the island in April, but had to cancel the trip last minute after testing positive for COVID-19. What would such a visit mean politically? Well, as second in line to succeed the U.S. president, I can assure you she is not going there for holidays. Quite the contrary. According to the FT article, the trip will be specifically made to quote-unquote show support for Taipei as it comes under mounting pressure from China, end of quote. Some may wonder, doesn't the U.S. have the freedom to do that? Well, there is only one problem. She will be tearing apart the U.S.'s own time-honored commitments on the issue. The U.S. commitment not to interfere in China's internal affairs and to sever official ties with Taipei was the basis of Sino-U.S. ties. In the three joint communiques defining diplomatic relations between the two sides, the U.S. repeatedly stressed that it recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal representative of China and that the U.S. does not challenge the position that across the Taiwan Strait there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China. The U.S. also promised that people of the United States will maintain cultural, commercial and other unofficial relations with the people of Taiwan. For those who may need a translation, it means the U.S. will not maintain official relations with Taiwan. Some people say, well, times have changed. To them, I suggest they check out the fact sheet on the official website of the U.S. State Department. It clearly says that the U.S.-China policy is guided by the three U.S.-China joint communiques. And the nature of U.S. ties with Taipei is unofficial. Such a promise does not belong in the archives. U.S. President Joe Biden has repeatedly said that the U.S. does not seek Taiwan independence. In my eyes, that means there is no room to upgrade the level of contact with Taipei. However, the U.S. seems to be cutting salami on the Taiwan issue. Despite historical and current promises, there has been no shortage of former or even incumbent U.S. officials stepping on the line. Since 2018, for instance, some 20 visits have been made by U.S. officials, according to a Chinese think tank, including six visits since President Biden took office. On the Taiwan side, there have been at least two visits to the United States. The two sides are definitely cozying up with each other. Let's hear what Taiwan TV commentator Dr. Huang Qixian recently told me about the collusion between Washington and Taipei. The U.S. knows very well that a Taiwan region that's not reunited with the mainland is an invaluable asset for them. A fitting analogy is that Taiwan is a watchdog for the U.S. who needs to bring his own food. It's more pathetic than that. We're Chinese, living on Chinese soil, and Taiwan is very important to China, but it's being penetrated by U.S. interests. Anyone who runs in general elections in Taiwan must report to the U.S. If you defy the U.S., there's almost no way to survive in politics here. 
So a China that is not reunited is invaluable asset to the United States and clearly Pelosi and all those who are rooting for her visit want to capitalize on that invaluable asset. Commitment? Not a problem. Speaking of, speaking of commitments, I almost forgot to mention U.S. commitments on limiting arms sales to Taiwan. In 1982, it promised not to seek to carry out a long-term policy of arms sales to Taiwan and that its arms sales to the island will not exceed either in qualitative and quantitative terms the level of those supplied in the early 1980s. But according to a report from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, this is clearly not always the case, especially in the past decade. And if you look at the data from public sources in the year 2019, arms sales reached over 10 billion US dollars, much higher than the hundreds of millions in the early 1980s. All I'm saying is you don't commit to something and then walk away from it and expect the other side not to complain or even protest. But when you read media reports on Pelosi's proposed visit, much of this context is amiss. Let me show you some headlines. China threatens, China warns, China heightens a warning to the United States, blah, blah, blah. Do I hear an echo? All of a sudden, the story seems not to be about how the U.S. is stepping back on its promises, provoking China, but about the China threat, a catchphrase among many media and politicians in the West. This Wall Street Journal article, for example, says, when asked about a Taiwan visit, the California Democrat declined to discuss her travel plans, citing security, and she sidestepped why Mr. Biden said the military had concerns about a trip. I think what the president was saying is, maybe the military was afraid our plane would get uh, shot down or something like that by the Chinese, Mrs. Pelosi said. I don't know exactly, she said. Mr. Biden hadn't discussed it with her. Sounds pretty clueless, right? As if she doesn't understand why the Chinese are reacting so strongly. But if you don't want to face any reactions from others, as I said, don't poke them in the first place. As I said, the U.S. promised to sever official ties with Taiwan, and that was the foundation of China-U.S. diplomatic relations. You cannot chop off the legs of a table and wonder why it is collapsing. Another sentence I kept coming across was that China claims Taiwan to be part of its own territory. Here's an example from Reuters. China considers the democratically governed island its own territory, and the issue is a constant irritant in ties between Beijing and Washington. And another from the Wall Street Journal, Beijing claims the island as Chinese territory, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not just China that considers Taiwan as part of China. The U.S. too, as you've heard from my introduction. In fact, this year marks the 30th anniversary of an important agreement called the 1992 Consensus between authorities on the Chinese mainland and the then authorities in Taiwan. It was agreed that both sides of the Taiwan Straits belong to one China and will work, towards, work together toward national reunification. A gathering in Beijing on Tuesday marked the occasion and sent an unequivocal message that if U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi goes ahead with her proposed visit to the island next month, it will have far-reaching consequences for Sino-U.S. relations and cross-strait situation. There is only one China. This is a fact that's recognized by almost the entire world. 181 countries have diplomatic relations with Beijing, and all sovereign member-only international organizations hold the same position. So it's not accurate to make it sound as if this is only a Chinese claim or assertion. So what exactly is Pelosi trying to accomplish through her proposed trip? What kind of agenda do some media possibly have to push for the visit? We'll take a quick break and when we come back, I'll ask my guests to comment on this issue and these questions. Stay with us. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story. 
and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Welcome back to Headline Buster, brought to you by me with uh, uh, three guests who are joining me now. They are Xiao Yuqing, Senior Fellow from Shanghai Institutes of International Studies, Surab Gupta, Senior Asia Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist with the Institute for China America Studies, and uh, Joseph Mahoney, Professor with East China Normal University. The warmest welcome to all of you. Um, Ms. Xiao, let me go to you first. I mean, from the Chinese perspective, it is uh, pretty clear why China is so angry about the proposed visit by Pelosi. But is there anything unclear to the American side about uh, the kind of a commitments the United States has made about not to have official relations with Taiwan? Um, does it come across as irrational that China would react so strongly to the news, to the U.S. side or to people outside of China? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And I think it's uh, it's uh, understandable, it's very natural that China would react angrily and strongly because the visit is very provocative in terms of its uh, negative impact on the China-US relations and also the cross strait relations. Um, the, the difficult thing right now is the US Congress because uh, when we talk about U.S.-Taiwan unofficial relationship, on the American side, uh, most of the people in Washington think that the Congress has a very important role to play on um, the U.S.-Taiwan relations. And also they think that Congress uh, reflects the sentiments and domestic politics. So they don't regard this as a kind of a, a U.S.-Taiwan official relationship. But on the Chinese side, of course, we are we don't agree with this kind of uh, um, things. And I think the most important thing for us to understand is right now, the one China policy adopted by the United States uh, is going toward the hollowing out trend, which they try to separate the U.S.-Taiwan relations with U.S.-China relations. Um, and also, they would like to expand the role of the U.S. Congress in this very sensitive and difficult issue mm. in China-U.S. relations. So I don't think uh, China's image is irrational now. Even in Washington, among the policy circles, a lot of experts, the, the real experts on China-U.S. relations and the Taiwan question, they oppose the possible visit by Nancy Pelosi. Just to make it absolutely clear, the Congress is part of the U.S. government, right, Ms. Xiao? Yeah. So yeah, this is very yeah, clear. There's course. no, there's no, you know, the Congress is Congress, U.S. government is U.S. government. So if a Cong Congress member or House Speaker going to Taiwan, definitely in an official capacity representing the U.S. government. Um, let me go to Mr. Gupta. Now, as we know, the last time... Um, the House, the former U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, did visit Taiwan in 1997. Of course, China was also uh, reacting very strongly, but it seems that this time is very different. What do you think have changed? What makes her visit particularly, especially contentious this time? I think what makes it particularly contentious this time is that the U.S. themselves have declared from 2017 or 2018 onwards that we are in great power competition with China. That was written into the national security strategy of the United States. It was a qualitative shift from where the U.S. was vis-a-vis -vis China in terms of how it approached China in the, in the, within the international community and in the Asia-Pacific region. And of course, as we've seen since then, particularly starting with the tariff war and going to the technology war, uh, relations have just spiraled downwards and it's been difficult to keep maintain a floor. I think the Biden team has managed to maintain some floor because I am very fearful if that if the Republicans do come in, I, I think we are looking for an, for an extraordinary crisis even beyond a Pelosi visit with, with regard to Taiwan Strait relations. But I think overall, uh, U.S.-China relations in this new age of self-declared by the United States great power competition has added a twist. 
uh, to the relationship. And as has been pointed out wrongly, I would say, because of Russia's actions, invasions in, in Ukraine, that has given added impetus for those who wish to frame Taiwan as being a sort of or a quasi-independent actor, that they have jumped into the mix and said, you know, see what happened in Ukraine, and we must not allow that to happen in Taiwan, even though that analogy is a false one. And I think this is bringing pressure on this issue. I see. We may come to that in just a moment, but I want to go to Prof um, Professor Mahoney there. Um, Clearly, as we mentioned, in, within the U.S. government, there are different opinions. And President Biden uh, said that he thinks the military is not, um, does not uh, think that Pelosi's proposed visit would be a good idea. But they come from the same political party. You know, they know each other for so long. They work in the U.S. They're all members, senior members of the U.S. government. How come they do not know each other's position beforehand? Have they not coordinated? I mean, is it? a show to the world, whereas deep down they know exactly what they're, what they're doing, just that they are playing different roles. Well, first, it's, it's quite reasonable to assume that there's a lot of consultation and likely coordination uh, between Biden uh, and the Speaker. Uh, as you noted, they are members of the same party. Uh, they, sh they share a legislative agenda. Uh, they want to see Democrats retain power. Um, second, uh, as a constitutional officer, as second in line to the presidency, uh, the speaker is entitled to regular uh, briefings from the military, uh, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, recently noted. And you asked the question a moment ago, you know, should we not consider her uh, a, a member of the government? You know, if she were just a rank and file member of Congress, um, uh, that's not such a big deal. But because she is a constitutional officer, um, it is a much more serious issue. It is a much more of a, carries much more overtones of, a, of an official visit that violates um, uh, the standards associated with the communiques. Now, um, uh, you know, so the extent to which uh, uh, Biden and, and Pelosi uh, are on the same page uh, is questionable. I mean, you know, Biden has raised this uh, question himself, uh, and some have uh, suggested, some analysts have suggested that her proposed trip is complicating uh, Biden's strategy towards China, uh, even putting him in a bind. But I, I don't think this does, or, or, or that it is doing so. Uh, I think it's very much in line with the broader trend we've seen underway since he took office, uh, keeping in mind that Biden has done far more provocative things than what Pelosi is now proposing. Would you go a little bit further on that? I mean, when you say there has been far more provocative things than the, the visit to Pelosi, what exactly do you mean? Well, I think, you know, example number one is AUKUS, you know, proliferating uh, uh, nuclear submarines uh, to Australia with, with uh, um, the, the very clear uh, yeah. intention. I see. Among okay. Other yeah. That's, that's your understanding that this is a much more provocative thing uh, than a, a visit, you know, just a few days, uh, sit some tea, sip some teas and some photo ops. But it clearly is not seen uh, in that light by the Chinese side. Ms. Xiao, Ms. Xiao, I want to go to you. Why is the Chinese reacting so strongly? Uh, not so much to the AUKUS, to the AUKUS, of course, also very strongly, but much more strongly and visibly strong, much stronger. Of course, the Taiwan issue, the Taiwan question uh, is uh, the Chinese core interests. Uh, it's the sovereignty issue. It's the inter uh, territorial integrity issue. So uh, we uh, are against, firmly against the foreigners' interference in, into our domestic politics. And also, um, uh, since the Biden administration came into power, uh, President Biden, he himself and his team, those senior officials, had repeatedly said that uh, the U.S. will continue its uh, one China policy. So Nancy Pelosi's uh, possible visit to Taiwan is certainly against one China policy. So uh, on the American side, uh, the, the actions, the behaviors do not match their words. So if you don't have, uh, if you don't commit to your 
uh, policy and one China policy, we know that uh, it's a very important political foundation of uh, China-U.S. Right. relations. What what are Chinese experts are saying? What are Chinese uh, analysts are saying about the you know the relationship between these two uh, U.S. leaders? Have they coordinated among each other between each other? So. Uh, you know, because we talked about this, do the Chinese believe what they're seeing here on the surface? Yeah, yeah. I think most of the most of the analysts here in China they they believe that uh, the two politicians they have coordinated with each other because they're from the same political party and they they are you know and that this uh, issue is related to the U.S. national security. It's it's a serious issue. It's not a, a, a kind of a, a lightful issue. So. Um, with a lot of people here believe that they have coordinate with each other. I don't know uh, whether uh, before the, uh, the the news media reported this possible visit, whether these two have coordinated. But after the media reported the visit, mm. uh, certainly these two have coordinated with each other. How strongly could China react? I mean, she was talking about possibly the Chinese military would shut down her, her yeah. plane. It, yeah. Would that be something that the Chinese would consider? Because, you know, very strong warnings were given out that there could even be military action. You know, China would go out all out if a core interest is infringed upon. So how far would China go in your in your eyes? Right. Uh, I, I pers my personal view is at the current stage, the Chinese side will um, try its best to make the deterrence. And uh, um, of course, it's uh, we will use military means to uh, stop uh, this uh, possible visit. I, I think it's possible. And also, like recall, uh, our ambassador in Washington and also some uh, sanctions, you know, all those. And also, we will stop the current coordination and dialogues on various issues with the American side. And also, uh, and like the improvement of people to people exchanges have just started. And, uh, and may soon stop again. So all these things that uh, are on the table, a lot okay. of uh, options here. Hmm. It would be an unfortunate, of course, uh, to see any of those right. actions taking place. But uh, uh, the, the ball is in the court of the United States. And Mr. Gupta, let's try to understand the mind of Ms. Mrs. Pelosi exactly. What does she have in her mind? Whether she coordinated beforehand, before the FT story came out or not with President Biden, what would she, um, what would she be thinking when she came up with this idea that she wants to go to Taiwan, first in April and now in August, what does she want to achieve? I'll be frank about it. She just wants to poke China in the eye. She is going to lose the speakership position, most likely at the end of this year after the midterm elections. If I understand correctly, she anyway, even if they do win, she will be stepping aside to have a next generation from the Democratic side. But anyway, the point is, I think she, the, the Democrats will not just lose, they will be hammered in the, in, the, in, in the House, not in the Senate. And therefore, her chance to ever come as a speaker to, to, to Taiwan, she could come as a congresswoman as, as part of a CODEL, but as speaker will, will have evaporated. And I think that is essentially what she's trying to get at, to poke China in the eye when she can. And this gets to the issue of coordination, too, because I'm not so sure whether this visit is coordinated, but I am certain that the visit in April was coordinated simply to make a message that, you know, Ukraine has been invaded and the U.S. is now going to step in and not allow these sort of actions to happen in another part of the world where it has interests. Well, this time around, I know for a fact that many senior administration officials have been giving her briefings not to go, and this has been going on for a while. So my view, frankly, is at the end of the day, we might just get a little lucky and not and have her not stop in Taipei. Right. It's speculative at this point of time, but she is there to poke China in the eye and do nothing more. And leave a political message and leave a political heritage from poking from the action, right, Mr. Gupta? That's, that's what you're saying. Professor Mahoney, what is your understanding of her objectives and uh, how much risks is she running against and how much 
um, stake, you know, is, is her decision poten potentially um, damaging? I agree. Uh, with my colleague that this is an attempt uh, to demonstrate strength in a time of, of increasing weakness. Uh, uh, and, and indeed, uh, if current projections hold true, her party will lose control uh, this fall, ending her speakership. Uh, so she's probably in the final months of her long career in power. She wants to go out with a bang. Um, but I think this, this also raises another point that I think we, we sometimes neglect, which is it's also the case that we should discount the significance of her trip in part because her time in power is so likely short. Uh, it could open the door, of course, to other provocative visits by others, but it might also create an opportunity to clear the slate when her successor takes power uh, this fall. I want to ask you a question about uh, interference in other people's internal affairs. It seems to be a time-honored tradition on the part of the United States. We've seen countless uh, examples of that. Um, how does, um, Professor Mahoney, where does that fit into this picture? Because uh, clearly the United States is trying to interfere in China's internal affairs there and uh, achieve its own political goals by doing that. Right. Well, you know, I think the, the immediate context of this, of this would be uh, what we're seeing in Ukraine uh, presently. You know, we can look at many other examples where the U.S. has intervened in China, whether it's related to Xinjiang, Hong Kong, or, or Tibet. Uh, we can look at uh, uh, what the U.S. has done in Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. There's a very long list. But, but you know, the, the famous example presently is Ukraine. Uh, and we know that the U.S. is responsible uh, significantly responsible in part for the conflict in Ukraine. It pushed NATO onto Russia's borders. It meddled in Ukraine's politics. It, fought, it fostered uh, political instability and uh, strained ties between Kiev and Moscow. And ultimately, when, when, with Biden in office, it effectively goaded uh, Russia into aggression um, that might have otherwise been avoided if a more conciliatory approach had been used. Uh, and then after the, the conflict uh, uh, began, the U.S. did whatever it could to isolate Russia diplomatically and economically uh, to the economic uh, and security detriment of Europe, which has now once again become dependent on the U.S., while the U.S. has waged a devastating proxy war against Russia and Ukraine. So why should we recount all of this? Because, you know, some people suspect that uh, uh, this is uh, kind of a similar strategy that the U.S. may be trying to employ with Taiwan, trying to uh, goad China into a conflict um, that many analysis, uh, an analysts say that um, China would not be prepared to fight for another five years at least. Uh, that's coming from, from Taiwanese uh, uh, as well as American uh, uh, intelligence uh, agencies. Um, so, uh, you know, why not go to China into a battle now when the U.S. still has uh, a competitive advantage militarily? Um, that's the, the bigger concern, and I think uh, news of this carrier group moving towards Taiwan now um, and uh, the, the, the previous reference of another uh, uh, Cuban missile crisis is something that we should be very concerned about. Mm. We have to leave it there. Many thanks to my panelists for this very important discussion. Xiao Yuqing, Senior Fellow from Shanghai Institutes for International Studies, uh, Surab Gupta, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist with the Institute for China-America Studies, and Joseph Mahoney, professor with East China Normal University.